I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the, Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians. Thessalonians chapter 5, we'll be reading verses 1 through 11 there this morning. First Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let none of us fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, O God, we pray for ears to hear, for words from you, and Lord, whatever words that I may add, may they be quickly taken away and forgotten, while your words remain and shape us more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. One of my favorite um, stand-up comedians. He died a few years ago. His name was Bernie Mac. Anybody? It's okay to confess if you listen to Bernie. Okay. Not all of Bernie's stuff is fit for church. I'll just say. But Bernie said one thing, uh, one, a little bit he did once, once upon a time was about when uh, the millennium was coming. He talked about how he had, had all this fear sort of built up about how You know, it was all over the news, those of you who can remember it or were alive then, I suppose. Um, How the computers were all going to crash, and the world was going to go haywire. And then there were preachers talking about, well, it's the year 2000, surely the world will end. And every grocery store tabloid probably had some picture of Nostradamus or an asteroid or something that's going to crash into the earth and kill us all. And Bernie bought in all of it, he said. He said, I remember it was December 31st. Hadn't gotten dark yet, turned the television on in the living room, turned the volume way up, and went and sat on on my front porch with a shotgun. He said, I was going to be ready for when it came. And he said he was sitting there, and and he was listening to the news, waiting for them to talk about the computers crashing, people looting and everything, when all of a sudden he heard people celebrating. He said, what? Looked down at his watch. It was only about 5 or 6 o'clock in L.A. And he said, wait a minute. If the Lord's coming back or if the computers are going to crash, are they going to do it on California time? And he went back in their house. He said he put his gun away and then went out and partied with his family and friends to celebrate not only the new year, but the new millennium. I think about that. My, by the way, my dad still thinks the y 2 case happening, so don't, like, don't, don't like shatter his thoughts about that if you ever meet him. Um, But I thought about that, and that's always stuck with me, Bernie Mac and his opinion about the Y2K, because I hear that sort of thing when people talk about the return of Jesus. That Jesus is going to come back, and and it's going to be this way, and and it becomes so insular and and personal and all sort of self-centered that this second coming, this return, this second advent of Jesus is going to somehow happen when my watch strikes midnight. You can imagine these first, these early Christians and the turmoil they were facing when Paul writes this letter. First Thessalonians is is believed by many to be the earliest book in the New Testament. It's definitely the earliest of Paul's letters, written somewhere around the year 50, probably. 
You can imagine what happened, right? Jesus is crucified, dead, buried, raised, and ascends into heaven around, say, let's say the year 35. And some time goes on. The apostles are all energized now at the resurrection of Jesus about this great commission he has given them before he ascends into heaven. And they go out and they begin to spread the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. And people begin to flock and churches begin to grow. And this Jew from Tarsus named Saul he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus and becomes known as Paul now and everyone. Everybody starts listening to what he has to say about this Jesus and this kingdom coming close. And then the clock just keeps on going. Time just keeps on passing. Some people say they even heard Jesus say that there are some in this generation who will not pass away until the kingdom of heaven has been fulfilled. And guess what started to happen? They started to die. People were dying, not of anything, not of any grand epidemic, but one over here, oh, well, you know, he lived to the ripe old age of 50. Back then, that was a pretty old age. You know, he's lived a long, full life. Someone else, oh, they've got a disease, they die. People began to die. And so these early Christians began to wonder, when is he coming back? What's going to happen? Is he coming back? When? And so the Christians at Thessalonica this is a real problem. And so they write Paul and say, we don't know what to do. Christians are dying. Those who had witnessed Jesus, who had seen him on the cross, who had heard his words with their own ears, they're starting to die. What do we do? What's supposed to happen? And so Paul writes this letter back to them to say, it's going to be okay. In fact, you know, as he says in the passage before us this morning, you all know, you don't walk in the dark. The Lord himself said, the day is coming like a thief in the night. You're not in the dark. Live like you're in the light. It reminds me of a story I've heard recently, and I've shared with some of you, uh, from a guy named Pete Rollins. Pete's a, an Irish philosopher, theologian. He has a monthly gathering called Icon in Belfast, uh, in Ireland, and, and what they do is they get together once a month in a bar, so it's not a Baptist gathering, uh, but they get together, uh, not a, it's a secret Baptist one maybe, uh, but they get together in a bar about once a month, and, and they bring in somebody who speaks about a, a theological thing, or they preach, or they share some story. And Pete told them, well, this month, next month, we're going to have someone come in, he's an expert on the second coming of Jesus. And so they were all really excited. This is something we want to hear about. I mean, justice and, and love and self-sacrifice, that's all good. But the second coming, that's what we want to hear about. So they were lined up outside the bar and the doors opened. They all came in and they bought some drinks and food, sat around at these tables. And there was a podium at the front and a microphone. And Pete said, he'll be here, oh, about 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock came, 10.05. Ten after, people started wondering, where's this guy at? Pete came up to the microphone and said, oh, I'm sorry, there's been, there's, there's been some traffic, but he's on the way. You know how these Irish drivers are. He'll be here, they'll be here. Oh, okay, no problem. They kept on, kept on. 10.30 rolled around. People started wondering, well, what's, what's going on? And Pete came back to the microphone, said, oh, there's been an accident, uh, uh, but, but don't worry, he's still coming. He's on the way. It's just going to be a while. Talk amongst yourselves. Have another round, whatever. Well, 11 o'clock came, and some people said, I'm not waiting on him anymore. And they got up and left. Some said, well, it's obvious he's not coming, so let's have another round. Let's order lunch. Let's all just get together and have a good time. And then some others said, well, I came here to talk about this. And so around their table, they all began to talk about Jesus and what he meant to them. And then Pete walked up to the microphone about an hour later and said, he's not coming. In fact, there is no he. I didn't invite anybody. <laughs> now, I might have been a little upset. but And he tells that story to say, see, this is what it's like. When we wait on Jesus, we're, we're waiting. And if it doesn't happen in our own time, we get upset. We get, we get frustrated. We walk out. We do something else. Or, or we hunker down and say, you know, we came here to do something. So let's do it. It's what Paul tells the church at Thessalonica. No, the Lord is tearing. The Lord's not here yet. But that doesn't mean you sit there all slack-jawed, staring up at the sky, wondering when he's going to come back. You know what you're supposed to do, Paul says. 
So get about doing it. I think about that when we, we have this table set before us. Now this morning we, we're, we're observing the communion because, well, communion, the oldest word for it is the Greek word Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. So I always think it's, I think it's sort of apropos to have communion the Sunday before thanksgiving. But you know, we don't just do it once and then are done with it. We, we recognize it over and over. We gather to be fed from the Lord's table over and over while He comes, while we wait. Do you all know it's covered now? What's written on the front of the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper table? In remembrance of me. Any of y'all ever seen something else written on the front of one? Most of the churches around here, you'll see that written on the front. But if you find some real old churches, old little churches with communion tables that have it on the front, sometimes what it says is not do this in remembrance of me, but it says until the Lord comes again. Written on the front of the table. A reminder that not only do we eat from the table until he comes and proclaim his death each time we do, as Paul says, until he comes. But whenever we gather in this space, we do it because there's something that compels us to be together, something that compels us to do what Christ calls us to do, even though, even though somewhere back in our minds we know we'll still wake up tomorrow and the sky won't split and Christ won't come. That, that, that the, the coming of Christ is still somewhere way down the line. Still, something compels us to come together. Something compels us to, to take from the Lord's table, to show kindness to a neighbor, to love one another, to do what Christ calls us to do. But here's the thing I'm also learning. While we may be waiting for that, that unseen end, that unseen future, the return of Christ, the truth is we're all waiting for some unknown, some unseen, something that gives us anxiety. Some of us are waiting for the results of a test. Is the biopsy going to come back hot? What about, what about the job interview I had? Or am I going to get that second call back? What about, what about the, the, the news? What's going to happen tomorrow? We're all living in some sort of tension about anxiety about the unseen Future. It's not just about when is Jesus coming back. The Thessalonians were worried about that. I hope in some way we are worried about that. But we're all facing some unseen future. And we can have the approach of where we just sort of shell ourselves in and say, no, no, I'm just going to wait until I get the result. I'm just going to wait until it happens. Or we can ignore it and pretend like it's not important and live and do whatever we want. Or in the meantime, while we wait, we hear the words from Jesus to call us always to the table, always into this space, always to the work that he's given us. And I think that's what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians. You do not belong to the darkness, where you turn out all the lights and cower in the corner and wait for the end to come. We belong to the day, Paul says. We belong to the day, and we are destined not for wrath, not for darkness, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that where, whether we are awake or asleep, we might wait for Him. Is that the word He says? That we might long for Him? No. So that we may live with Him. We may be about what Christ has called us to be about here and now, in the present. Therefore, Paul says, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. This morning we come to the Lord's table to do just that. To encourage one another. To, to admonish each other. To build up each other. And I don't know if you normally do this when we have communion, and I know we, it wasn't too long when we celebrated at baptism, but I want you to be intentional about it this morning. As that tray comes by, as you take it, you're going to hand it to somebody else. 
But I want you, whether you say it out loud or whether you think it as you hand it or whether you just pause for a moment to pray, just think about that neighbor, that person sitting next to you, that person who's waiting with you on the return of Christ. To say a prayer for them in your mind. To remind them of God's love as you pass the bread, as you pass the cup. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. And we'll do it again today and the next time and each and every time while we wait. For it gives us encouragement to be with one another and to be served from the Lord's table until he comes again. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, when we, in our own small ways, Lord, shrink in fear. Sometimes, Lord, we can't help it. When we don't know what's ahead of us, it's so easy, Lord, to doubt and to be afraid. But God, we trust that you forgive us. We trust that you encourage us with your Holy Spirit in the presence of brothers and sisters around us. So even now, Lord, as we come to the table, Lord, remind us of your presence among us, not in the bread, not in the cup, but in your presence as the gathered body of believers who come together, Lord, to celebrate and to worship with one another. So be with us now, Lord, as we are served from this table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.